Welcome to Barcelona. It's the first time I'm here. Beautiful city. Walked around yesterday. It was definitely a nice city. I wish I was here for a couple extra days after the conference, but unfortunately, I got to go back home. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Joe Granja. Um, I'm, the, I'm on the Spring Security team working with Rob Winch, the lead on Spring Security. And uh, today's talk is we're going to do a, an architecture deep dive on Spring Security. So uh, as, as you guys know, <clears throat> Getting deep into a technology is critical, especially when it comes to troubleshooting. Troubleshooting, got to have those skills because things always go wrong with software. Software is just not easy to build, right? Things always go wrong. There's always issues. So the deeper you get into the frameworks, the libraries, the technologies that you're you know, working on, like Spring Security, the better, the more effective you'll be to be able to troubleshoot. So this is kind of like a, a a 101, you know, but it's really for beginners and intermediates because we're going to get pretty deep into talking about, you know, the core interfaces, the, the, the different implementations, the core filters, what the filters do, how the request proceeds, you know, through each of the filters, what the responsibility of the filters are, and, and, and so forth. There's obviously a lot we could talk about at Spring Security. We're going to focus today strictly on three key areas, okay? These are the three, I mean, this is where it starts. You gotta authenticate with the system. You gotta identify yourself with the system first and foremost, right? Um, secondly, <clears throat> after I've identified with the system, what authorities do I have to access the different protected resources within the system? So authorization, I'm gonna focus on that second. And then exception handling, what happens when I try to access a protected resource that, and I'm not authenticated, what happens? How does the exception handling happen between the different filters and so forth? Um, second scenario is I'm authenticated, but I don't have access to a, to a specific resource. So this is what we're gonna focus on, these three key topics as we progress through the presentation. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a demo, and then, I'm gonna, then we're gonna go on you know, the slides. But before that, I just wanted to kind of gauge the audience Who's been using Spring Security for, let's say, four to five years on multiple projects? If I could get a raise of hands. Perfect, okay. And how about uh, two to three years on you know, three or four projects? Okay, great. And haven't used Spring Security starting off, just used it on a couple of projects? Okay, right on. We got, so we got a good mix here, perfect. Um, so, so yeah, I'm going to start, this is not a live coding session, um, but I'm going to do a demo. Um, at the end of it, there'll be a GitHub repo location. You could check it out yourself. Um, but basically, it's a messaging, it's a messaging example, a very basic application. Check your, check your inbox, your sent messages, send a message. The, the public facing site is an Angular app Spring Boot. Um, and then we have an administration site where I could view all the messages and, and manage the messages, right? And obviously the administration site, you have to be administrator to be able to log on, right? The public facing site, you just have to be a registered user or regular user. So we have these three users here, Joe, Rob, and admin. And as you can see, authorities, we're gonna be talking about authorities quite a bit as we you know, go through the presentation, but authorities is what permissions do we have um, to access specific resources. Now, authorities could be roles. It's typically roles, but it could be finer grained positions, uh, permissions like read, write of specific resources. But we're going to keep things simple, um, and we're just going to focus on role-based authorization checks. Okay, so um, let's uh, let's jump to the demo here, and I'm going to just quickly show you. So this is, uh, this is the main site, the public facing site where users log on. Actually, before I even log on here, I'm gonna show you, so I'm gonna try to access, I'm gonna try to access the site here. And, uh, oops, by default, the way I got things set up here with Angular, I try to access the website, I'm not logged in, it'll automatically um, try to get, or sorry, it'll automatically try to um, get the inbox, all the inbox messages. I'm not logged in, 
and then I'll get a 403. So as you can see over here, or 401, unauthorized. So as you can see here, the, the trying to access the inbox, I get a 401 because I'm not authenticated. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about one of those flows. Okay, now I'm gonna authenticate. Okay, so I logged in here and the key piece of information I want to show you here is, so this, this uh, principal endpoint, so this basically fetches uh, the, the um, authenticated identity within the system. So as you can see on the top right, Joe Granja, right? So I've authenticated as myself. And uh, this endpoint is where I do the authentication. So when I fetch, when I fetch uh, 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 the user info on that endpoint, I also do H2 basic authentication. So the way I've set things up here, um, on the public facing site, and we're going to look at the security configuration as the HTTP basic authentication uh, mechanism happening for the public facing site. And on the admin site, it's custom form login. So we're going to get to that next. But as you can see here, and I want to point this out because I'm going to reference this throughout the presentation. Um, as you can see in the request here, we have the authorization header, basic scheme, and then base64 encoded username and password, right? So just make a note of that as, as we progress through the uh, application. So I'm authenticated. That's the authenticate, authenticated flow, the authentication first you know, key area we're going to talk about. Now authorization, right? So I'm going to go through a couple of flows here um, where we're going to say I'm not authorized. So I'm Joe. Um, I'm a regular user. I'm going to try to access the admin site. I'm authenticated as a regular user. I'm going to try, try to access the admin site right now and let's see what happens here. I'm going to erase this. Right, so obviously I get a 403, right? It's to be expected. So, so we got our 403 down here, right? So we're gonna go over we're gonna go over this flow, the access denied flow, um, in the exception handling in the in in uh, the presentation portion. So now um, now I'm gonna I'm just gonna show you quickly the admin site here. This is a Thymeleaf based application and it's custom form login. Okay, so I log in here. This is pretty basic. It's one page. I could see all the messages, right? And now because I'm, I'm an admin user and a regular user, I could also access the main, the main site. So very basic application. There's not much to it. But I just wanted to demonstrate the different flows, the authentication and the two authorization, authorization checks that we're going to go through. So let's head back to the presentation here. OK, so authentication. Let's talk about authentication. So I'm going to grab a drink of water here. So uh, that part of the demo where we saw the, the uh, HP Basic um, header, so we're gonna we're gonna go through that. This is the public facing site. So now I got these diagrams, um, these collaboration diagrams or sequence di different versions of sequence diagrams. We're gonna like basically go through the authentication flow first off, mm -hmm. and we're gonna like basically flow with the response, right? And as the flow as, as the response is flowing through, we're gonna see what components get hit, and ultimately understand. Um, and get familiar with all the core components within Spring Security. So the first, the first thing, I have, the request comes into the authentication filter. So for, these, for those of you that are familiar with the abstract authentication processing filter, different extensions of that. So that is um, the, the, um, it's the authentication processing filter. So we have a basic one, we have a custom form login one, we may have an OAuth one. Whatever your authentication mechanism is, you typically extend that filter, right? Um, I'm keeping a generic here, authentication filter, and I got that special stereotype H2 basic. So the HTTP basic authentication filter, it's looking for the authorization header, the basic scheme, right? On the public site, as we saw, as we saw in the demo there on the request, we had, you know, the authorization header, the basic scheme. So this filter will extract the username um, and password de uh, from the header, base64 decode it from the request. That's the first thing that happens, right? So now that I have the username and password, 
it'll create this user username password authentication token. So I, I got the special stereotype up there, authentication, one of the core interfaces, one of the central interfaces within, within Spring Security, the authentication interface. And we're gonna talk more about that on the next slide. Um, but in this, in this specific, uh, the, the, the implementation authentication for the HTTP basic flow, it's using the username and password authentication token, because it's username and password. Obviously, if it was OAuth, it would be token some kind of a OAuth token, authentication token, for example. So it creates this authentication instance, and then it passes it to the authentication manager, calls it calling the authentic authenticate method. So the authentication, so this, this is, like I said, this is the cent, one of the central um, interfaces within Spring Security. And the authentication can represent two different things, right? So if I'm not authenticated with the system, in that instance, it represents an authentication request, right? I'm trying to authenticate with the system. It's an authentication request. After the system has successfully authenticated um, the identity, then, then the representation is an authenticated principle, right? So we've got authentication request before authentication, after authentication, authenticated principle, right? It's the same, same interface. But obviously, the attributes within the implementation are different, right? As you can see in the top there, the principal is the username, credentials is the password, right? When, it, when it's an authentication request. Now, authorities, obviously, there's no authorities because they haven't authenticated. The system hasn't loaded authorities and attached it to the authenticated principal. And obviously, the flag authenticated is false. Now, after successful authentication and the underlying authentication provider and its collaborators, will populate the authentication object with all the data that's stored within the identity store, the identity system. So in this case, we'll have principal user details, one of the, one another core interface within Spring Security, and we're gonna get into that as we, as we flow down through the request there on the authentication flow. Um, credentials, obviously, you know, you never wanna store credentials in memory, right? So that's, that's erased. Um, and then authorities, role user, right? So in this case, this specific flow that I'm driving on, it's myself. I'm just a regular user, so I got role user there, right? Um, and obviously, authenticated flag is set to true, right? So, so that's, that's the authentication. So let's, let's progress now. Um, as you can see, there's the interface there. I mean, there's a few other operations, but these are the key ones that we're really gonna be referring to throughout the presentation, is the principal credentials and one or more authorities that the identity has. Okay, so user details. On that last slide, the principal was a user details instance. And I, and I do want to point out that you're not tied to that. You don't have to use a user details implementation for your identity. Really, it's, it comes down to the authentication provider. The authentication provider, um, the authentication provider, its sole responsibility is to return another authentication instance, right? With whatever it wants to populate in the principle. So you might have you know, specific requirements where you don't want to implement user details, you don't want to use your user detail service, um, and you could freely do whatever you want to do. Like all, the sole responsibility of the authentication provider is literally to return an authentication in instance with a principle, any type of object, because it's typed object for the return type, and populated with authorities and the flag set to true, right? Um, but this example and the, this sample and this example, I'm driving on the user details because we provide it out of the box. Um, we got a user detail service. A lot of things are ready there for you. Implementing an authentication provider from scratch, I mean, you could do it, to totally free to do that, but we're trying to provide as much um, different components that you could use right out of the box and ultimately write less code. That's always the goal, right? <clears throat> so let's, let's flush down with the authentication manager here. So authentication comes into the authentication manager and the authentication manager, it's delegation based, right? It's delegating to one or more providers. So you may have, I mean, most cases you'll have, well, a lot of cases you'll have um, one identity store, right? And therefore one authentication provider. But you have total flexibility to have more than one. Um, and in big, in big uh, corporations, you, you definitely have more than one identity store. So you want to be able to, 
tell the authentication um, manager to the providers if there's more than one, try to authenticate, right? It'll try with the first one. If it can't authenticate, it'll try with the next one. As long as there's two, and as long as the two support the current authentication coming in, right? And when I say support, um, the authentication provider, there's a supports operation, I believe it's called supports, um, and it just returns the type of authentication it supports. So when I say type, Earlier on, we had username and password authentication token, so to return that. So if I had two authentication providers that return username, password, um, authentication token, then both of those providers will get tried in sequence if the first one can't um, return authentication, right? If we got two identity stores in, let's say, two different databases, right? Um, so that's, so that's how, how the authentication manager work. It'll literally delegate to one or more providers asking, can you authenticate? So let's make the assumption that, well, in our sample is one authentication provider happens to be the, the DAO authentication provider that actually collaborates with the user detail service, right? Um, so we're gonna drive on that example. So the authentication provider or the DAO authentication provider will call the load user by username on the user detail service. So this is the, the interface uh, for the user detail service. Passes in the username, which is ultimately the principle from the past in authentication that's coming in. Um, and then the implement implementation of that will return a user details instance, right? So we have a user details instance here, or an implementation returns the username, password, and authorities. Now, now that password there, yeah, it better be decrypt or encrypted, right? You, don't, you definitely don't want to return um, you know, a clear text password, and it's because everything's stored in memory there, right, in an HP session. So in the authentication, we, we erase the credentials. And you know, if you are using the user detail instance, um, your, your own implementation, you want to make sure you pass you know, either an encrypted password or null, right, um, for security reasons. So, uh, so we return a user detail instance, and then this authentication provider will return a new username password authentication token with the user details um, as a principal, as you can see here. And then it'll also populate the, the, the roles, right? So the user detail service, in this case, it could look, the ro look, look up the roles in another database for, the, for that specific identity and then load the authorities for the user or the roles. Now, authentication provider, authentication provider returns the username and password authentication token back to the authentication manager. Authentication manager passes it back to the authentication filter. So the next step in the filter, the authentication processing filter, if authentication is successful, is it needs to save that authentication somewhere so on subsequent requests, um, accessing protected endpoints, you don't have to re-authenticate. So how does that happen? And this is where the security context come in, comes in. Security context, I've talked to a lot of people and people um, sometimes kind of get, are not too clear on what the security context does, right? And the, the, the most simplest way I could explain it is it's a holder for, for context information related to security. Right, simple as that. Um, and and ultimately, if we look at this, if we look at the interface here, security context, it literally just has get authentication, right? But if you have specialized cases and, and, and big enterprises, you very well may have um, different specialized cases where you want to have other security information that's attached to that authenticated principle could be uh, domain specific or network related or so forth, right? And you know, so you can extend the security context, you can provide other security related information. So ultimately you have this one package, right? The security context implementation where all the security information, the sensitive information is stored, right? Um, so the authentication processing filter, it'll get the authentication and then it'll call the security context holder access the, security, the current security context and set the authentication with this bit of snippet of code here. So as you can see here, the security context holder, 
It's, uh, it's got a thread local member, member variable there. And, uh, and that's where it stores the security context for the current request, the current thread, the current user, right? Um, and, and this is, again, authentication security context central throughout Spring Security used everywhere, right? The last thing we want to do is pass security context or authentication, you know, across filters as parameters and all that and propagate it everywhere. So this is really, you know, having this thread, thread local within the security context holder, we could access the authentication security context in all the filters, the authentication manager provider and so forth, right? So that's the purpose of the security context holder to be able to access the security context and authentication throughout all the filters and all the different uh, you know, providers and so forth. Okay, let's do a recap um, of the authentication. So authentication request comes in to authentication processing filter, creates an authentication token, passes it to the authentication manager, which delegates to one or more authentication providers. And the providers may use a user detail service or just may have some custom logic, might go through a proprietary API to look up the identity in an external store. Um, the provider then will return an authentication instance with the principal um, associated with it, the authorities, and then all the way back to the authentication, uh, to the authentication processing filter, which will ultimately set the authentication on a security context, right? That's the authentication flow. Understanding this flow is applicable. It's the same pattern across any other authentication mechanism that you're using, whether it's HTTP basic, custom form, OAuth, Kerberos, um, and so forth. So having understanding this pattern will allow, you know, I wanted to really just kind of build off on HP Basic because, you know, OAuth and some of the other um, authentication mechanisms or schemes are a little bit more complicated. This is the more simpler one. But this is the pattern, right? So you understand this pattern, you can pick up the other ones fairly quickly, right? Okay, we're going to jump to authorization, but I kind of want to, like, just see if anyone has any questions instead of saving at the end. So if anyone has any, you know, two questions, right, go for it. Yes. Yeah, no, good question. So Rob Winch, the lead on Spring Security, he's working on that end of things. So Spring Security 5 milestone 1, we just released it last week. So we have the initial reactive support there and the new OAuth support, which is actually going into Spring Security. And I know that you're not talking about that, but I'm already plugging that. I'm going to plug it later too. <laughs> But, but you know what, <laughs> I haven't been working on that end of things. That's a Rob Winch question for sure, but it's, it's out right now on the first milestone. So you, could, so you could check it out, yeah. Is there any other questions before I jump to authorization? Okay, so let's jump to authorization then. Filter security interceptor. So this is, <clears throat> this is, the last filter in the spring security filter chain or the, the security filter chain um, that basically protects access, you know, for protected resources, right? This is the last chain that checks for, am I authenticated, right? Um, am I authorized to access this endpoint? So, so let's, let's go through that. And, and I'm obviously jumping way ahead. Um, there's actually quite a few filters, the, obviously the authentication processing filter is somewhere um, near closer, you know, within the chain. Filter security interceptors in the end. I was talking about the security context um, uh, earlier and there's a security context persistence filter, which ultimately um, clears the security context at a threat local, saves it in HTTP session, ultimately restores it back on a subsequent request based on the session, right? So there's a lot of filters, but we're literally focusing on authentication processing filter, filter security interceptor, and then the exception, exception translation filter, which is coming up next, right? So let's, uh, let's, let's proceed. We're going down the request. We're authenticated as myself, Joe, regular user, right? This is the, the URI we're accessing in the inbox. So what happens here is the filter security interceptor 
It'll call the match method in the security metadata source. Security metadata source, what is this? So you guys are definitely familiar with um, web security configure adapter, and then you have the http.authorize request.ant matchers, um, you know, slash messages, slash star star has role user, for example, right? Or XML, intercept URL, you know, your request pattern, access, role user, right? So that's your security metadata. Right? That's where you're configuring. You're configuring certain endpoints, providing certain um, access privileges, and ultimately that's in the security metadata source implementation. That's an interface. Um, and the filter security interceptor has, has that as a member variable. So it will call the match <coughs> method passing in the current request. Right? This is a security metadata representation, what I was just talking about. This is how it looks like um, within the source here. We have a, the request pattern and the config attributes role user. So the current request, as you can see the, up there, is messages slash inbox. And that's a match right, with the request pattern. So what, ultimately what happens is that config attribute role user is returned right here on number two. Right? And then the filter security interceptor will get the current authentication from the holder, security context holder which is you know, the user details, role user. And then it's going to pass it to the access decision manager. All right? So let's look at this here. Let's drill down here. So three pieces of information right, that go to the access decision manager. We've got the authentication, we've got the security metadata, and we've got the current request. Right? And as you can see here, the security metadata, we have role user. So only for the current for this current request, role role user authorities are allowed to access allowed access, right? So this is the happy flow, um, and what happens here, just like the authentication managers delegation based um, with one or more authentication providers, access decision managers is the same. It's delegation based could have one or more access decision voter. In this sample, there's um, there's one role voter. As a matter of fact, it's a web expression voter, but like I said, I'm keeping things simple. The web expression voter is a little bit more, well, it's definitely way more powerful, um, a little bit more complicated, a lot more different components um, involved. So I'm really keeping things simple here and just sticking to the role voter, right? And uh, so we have, you know, in the sample, over here we have one instance of an access decision voter, role voter calls the vote method on the, on, on the one voter, and it's granted based on, as we can see, the inputs, right? The happy flow, right? So this is how the authorization checks happen, right? With the access decision manager and one or more voters. So let's do, do a recap here before I get into uh, um, the exception handling cases where I'm unauthenticated or access denied. So filter security interceptor. Um, basically obtains the security metadata on the current request, returns the config attributes, then it gets the authentication, and then it passes these three pieces of information to the access decision manager, the config attributes, the current request, and the authentication. And then it delegates to one or more voters. Right? These are the three pieces of information that ultimately are needed to be able to make an access decision. Okay, so before I get into the exception handling, um, any questions on the authorization and the things? Yes. Good question. Yeah. Um, so, so there's there's three implementations of Access Decision Manager. We have unanimous base, consensus base, and affirmative base. All right, so consensus is majority rules. So if there's, let's say, two voters, right? Um, two vote, or let's say three voters. Two vote, granted. Two deny, denied, right? Um, unanimous, everyone's got to be granted. Or abstain, there's actually an abstain as well, right? Um, and then, uh, what was the other one? Unanimous, consensus, and affirmative. At least one has got a grant. So those are the three implementations of Access Decision Manager. 
access decision voter, there's multiple implementations actually, right? So this, the one I showed you is the simplest one, right? Role-based. The most powerful one is the web expression voter, and that's typically what's used with Java configuration. Using Java configuration, you're doing ant matchers slash, you know, your request pattern dot has role. That's actually a web expression, you know, using Spring expression language. Um, I didn't want to get into that too much because there's a few other things involved with, with um, the web expression voter and, and, and Spring expression language. Um, but uh, yeah, did that answer your question? Perfect, okay. Is there anyone else? One moment, please. Yes. Yeah. The way the way the the way the authentication gets loaded and cleared uh, for the current request is so the 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 security context persistence filter. Did you? Sorry. Oh. Oh. Okay. Go for it. Go for it. Hello. <laughs> uh, security. Oh wow! It's too loud now. Uh, the security. The authentication is sitting on the session in this particular example. Yes, yes. yes. So, so the security context persistence filter, which yeah, it's, it's not in this presentation, I just kind of did it at high level. Its sole responsibility is to load the authentication for the request that's coming in based on the you know, session ID. Right? So by default, it, it is stored in HTTP session. However, with Spring Session, you could store it in an external store, whether that's Redis or Gemfire or, or whatever, right? Um, but by default, just out of the box, it's stored in HTTP session. So what happens, current request comes in, session ID comes in, it fetches the authentication from the session and then sets it on the security context for that thread, right? And then at, when the re response comes back, the security context persistence filter clears the authentication from the, or clears the security context from the holder and and, and because obviously we have the thread local there that's going to get put in a pool. We don't want authentications getting mixed up between different requests or different users, right? So the security context persistence filter sole responsibility is that load the session, from, load the authentication from the session, and then clear it on the way out. Yeah. Is there anyone else before I jump to the exception handling? Okay. <clears throat> So the exception handling cases. So I, I, in the demo there, I showed two cases where the first case was, I'm not authenticated. I'm trying to access a protected resource. What happens, right? The authenticated flow. So we're going we're gonna to talk about that um, first and what happens there. And the second case was, I'm authenticated, but I. I'm not authorized to access the admin site, for example, because I'm just a regular user, right? So we're going to go through those two um, flows and, and what happens. <clears throat> so the first one. Um, so yeah. So the first one is so I'm authenticated as Joe, and I'm trying to access the admin site. As we can see, there URI admin messages. So the exception translation filter, right? sits behind or in front, however you want to look at it. Um, well, the request is going this way, so it's sitting behind the filter security interceptor. And the exception translation filter, it literally wraps, um, wraps the call in a try-catch block and lets the request proceed, right? That way, because the filter security interceptor can throw an authentication exception or an access denied exception. So the exception translation filter's sole responsibility is to handle those two exceptions and then navigate the flow, right? So that's, that's what we're going to go through. So as you can see here, I'm logged in as myself, Joe, role user. I'm trying to access the admin site, which only role admin is allowed. Security metadata. Um, Filter security interceptor gets the security metadata. As you can see, the request pattern admin, role admin, right? That's a match on that current request. So the config attribute is role admin, but the authentication, we got role user. So it's, that's not a match, and we'll see what happens here. Once again, we go through the access to the decision manager, call the vote to the voters or the one voter, and this time it's denied, right? Then the access decision manager like we were talking about, there's unanimous base, consensus base, um, affirmative base, 
In this case, we have one role, vo role voter by default. It, it's the, by, by default, in this instance, the access decision manager is affirmative based, right? But we have one voter, it's denied, and ultimately the access decision manager throws access denied exception. So let's go, let's go into the exception translation filter and, and see how this works. <clears throat> so like I was saying, uh, the exception translation filter catches the exception, access the deny, deny exception, and it determines, determines uh, what flow am I navigating, right? Is this, a, is this an access denied or is it an unauthorized? In this case, it's access denied, I'm authenticated, and then it delegates to the access denied handler. As you can see, the interface there, pretty, uh, so we got the request, the response, and the exception that it gets passed in. And uh, so the default implementation here, um, access design, the uh, access uh, denied handler returns status 403, right? But this is definitely, I mean, there's a lot of plug-in points within Spring Security, but this is definitely um, one I like to make a note of because especially if you're with a bank um, and you just want to see, you know, you want to do some extra, you know, auditing, right, of, you know, uh, protect the resource being trying to access where you want permission. So in this case, you might want to extend a default implementation, do some extra logging, or you know, flush it out to Splunk or, or whatever, right? Um, but by default, this implementation simply returns 403. Okay, so let's go through, let's go through the, um, <coughs> the uh, unauthenticated flow. So I'm not authenticated, just like right at the beginning of the demo, I haven't authenticated, I'm trying to access messages in the inbox. What happens? So anonymous user, current authentication is anonymous user. Um, by default, Spring Security configures this anonymous authentication filter. And by default, it'll um, you know, create an anonymous authentication token, right? So that's, that's that representation. And there's no, it's, I mean, the principle's populated, there's, there's no authorities, right? Security metadata. Role user, going through the same flow here, access decision manager delegates to the voter. This time it's denied, throws an access denied exception. Not an authentication exception, throws an access denied exception. The, <clears throat> the, the filter security and interceptor, it's not in this flow, but I just wanted to point this out. Um, before it even delegates the access decision manager, if there's no current authentication or if you've configured to re-authenticate every time, because you can configure that in certain use cases, then it'll actually call the authentication manager before it actually calls the access decision manager for authorization checks. Um, and so potentially an authentication exception can get thrown, but we're not kind of going over that right now, but I just wanted to point that out. So it throws an access design exception and an exception translation filter will determine, okay, is this really an access denied or is this, you know, I'm not authenticated, right? And, and, and it navigates the flow that way. So in this case, um, not authenticated. And as you can see here, instead of the access denied handler, we have this authentication entry point interface, right? So, you know, sim similar interface takes the request, takes the response, and takes the authentication exception this time instead of access denied exception. And uh, Depending on the authentication mechanism that or <coughs> mechanism that you've configured, whether it's HTTP Basic or Custom Form lo Login or OAuth, um, there'll be a different type of authentication entry point attached. So, <coughs> in this, because we have HTTP Basic configured, we're going to have an HTTP Basic specific authentication entry point. So it follows the, H the HTTP Basic protocol, right? Which is basically returning um, the WW authenticate header, the basic scheme, and the realm, right, to authenticate against. So when you get that pop-up box um, on your browser, when you're trying to access a protected, protected resource, it looks for that header and then it pops that up for you to authenticate. You didn't see that in the demo because um, with Angular, I have an interceptor there that just looks for 401 responses and then it just navigates to the client site template for the login, right, just, so, just for your information there. Um, but that's, that's basically um, what happens with HTTP Basic. Now, a custom form login is, is different, um, and that's probably the one you're probably very familiar with, is you'll see a 302 redirect, the authentication entry point. If you got 
um, form login configured, you know, HTTP.form login configured, the authentication entry point will be, I think it's like simple URL authentication entry point, if I remember correctly, and it basically sends a 302 redirect with the location to redirect to, which is typically slash login, right? So that's that flow. Um, <clears throat> so let's do a recap of the exception handling. So for, for access denied, um, the exception translation filter will delegate to an access denied handler um, and by default returns uh, 403. Now, if I'm not authenticated, then we got to trigger the authentication process. It ultimately delegates to the authentication entry point, right? Pretty basic. Well, it's not that basic. But <laughs> so that, so that, that wraps up the three key areas. Um, there's something else I want to talk about, and this is, this is definitely a really important one. Um, I'm glad I got some time here. But before I jump into this, is there any questions on the exception handling scenarios? I've got a question about uh, the response body in an exception case. Um, is there planned any support for, uh, for instance, um, problem documents? There's so an RFC for problem documents since uh, a year or so. Uh, Sorry, say that again, problem documents? Um, yeah, uh, it's a, uh, a new RFC for okay. um, uh, specific problems uh, that, uh, yeah, the response body can contain a specific format to document the problem. Okay, so it's, a, so it's basically a structured format for an error response, yep. this spec. I'm not actually familiar with that spec. Um, and we, from what I recall, we don't have any issues or even PRs that have been submitted. Is this spec finalized? Uh, I think so, yes. Okay, yeah, I'll talk to you, talk to you after about that. Um, please let me know um, the spec. I'll, I'll definitely look into that. Um, from, from what I'm aware now, no, there's, there's no plan. I, I haven't even heard of this spec, actually. There's so many specs out there. It's, you know, the only way we really know is if an issue is logged. So, like, if you want to log an issue, that'd be great, and we could take a look at it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions? Um, how does this relate to the um, exception controller advices, uh, more on a controller level? Because at that level, you can also uh, catch the security exceptions, the access denies exception, and then return uh, the JSON body responses uh, for <coughs> the cases you want to route uh, through Angular yeah. to your login form. So controller advice, it's already past the filter security, and it's already out of the spring security filter chain, okay. right? Um, so it doesn't even get to the, 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 the controllers and ultimately the, the controller device. Like the filter security interceptor, mm -hmm. um, all the filters sit in front of the hand, ultimately the, the handler, right? The controller, right? Yeah. So in, 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 in that case, it doesn't even get to um, the- yeah, The exceptions are already caught. E exactly, okay. yeah. Oh. Any other questions before we jump to this? Okay, so um, actually, even before we jump to this diagram, I want to show you the security configuration because it will make more sense when we, um, we look at this diagram. I personally find this really helpful because the Spring, the spring Security filter chain is, is, is it's a filter of filters. There's a ton of filters in that one filter. It's a composite of filters, composite of filter security chains that have multiple filters in each of the chains, right? And it could get kind of confusing. And if you, when you're using Spring Boot, there's also, um, you know, Spring Boot creates filter chains. So there could be multiple one. As, as a user, you, you know, you'll typically configure one. You could configure more than one, but in most cases it's one. But you're using Spring Boot, Spring Boot injects one or more filters, for example, the actuator end, endpoints. Um, and, there's, and there's other filters that, depending on what you're, what you've, um, what you're using, there could be more. So, and I want to I want to go over this. I want to go over this and show you this. So, <clears throat> the application. We got two. Conf we got two um, security filter chains. We got two web security configure adapters. 
which ultimately map at runtime to security filter chains, right? And we're gonna get to that on the diagram, but let's just kind of go over this quickly. Um, so the app security config, admin security fig, right? Admin site, public site. Um, we're not gonna go through all of this stuff, but I just wanna point out, um, so obviously we've configured HTTP basic here, right? And then we've configured has role user. There's a couple other authorization rules. We won't get into that though. I just wanna keep this really high level. Um, and then in min security config, we have form login, custom form login, right? And, but we got, we, we got this extra, extra little uh, configuration here where, you know, hp.ant matcher. So apply this configuration to any URI that's rooted at admin, right? We have that there, but we don't have this at the top here. Um, and, and just in case you don't know, by default, if you don't specify that, by default, it's any request. Right? So any request that comes in, apply that. And this is where things could get confusing sometimes because you might, you might, if you have two filter chains and one of them is never getting called, a lot of the times it's because of this. It's the ordering of the filter chains. As you can see here, um, we have this annotation here, the order, that order two, order one. Now this, remember this because this is definitely um, you know, a case that I see a lot where one of the filter chains never get applied because the any request filter chain is sitting at the top of the iteration order. And so we gotta make sure the filter chains are ordered properly, right? So as you can see here, we got order two for any request, for the, for the any request and ultimately the public site and order one admin site because it's most specific. Because the way Spring Security works, like I said, the well-known Spring Security filter chain it, it can have one or more filter chains composed within it. In this case, we have two, although there is more because there's Spring Boot ones, but we're just gonna talk about these two. We're just gonna assume there's two, right? Now, if those orders were reversed, right, and app security fig had order one, then that, that admin one is never gonna get called because with the way it works internally is it's got, um, you know, these filter chains that are ordered based on the order attribute, specific order, and it just iterates, right, um, over that list. So in this case, if I switch that, obviously the first one is any request, it's always gonna hit that one. Admin is never gonna get called. So I, I, I find this to be, um, you know, one of the, one of the issues that I, that I reported quite a bit is my filter chain's not getting called. So, you know, just remember this, and it's, it's most likely to do with this order. Okay, so, so we looked at the, the security configuration. Let, let's jump to this diagram, just to get that high level view. I find it personally interesting myself, like getting that top level view um, <clears throat> of you know, how Spring Security works, how it looks underneath the covers, right? Um, so you know, the well-known Spring Security filter chain, right? That's the B name registered in the context. The implementation class is filter chain proxy, right? And like I said, it's composed of one or more security filter chain instances, right? And the security filter chain, you know, the filter chain proxy, when a request comes in, it'll iterate over each of the security filter chains saying, does this current request match, right? And as you can see, the request pattern, any request for the first one, right? And the second one is the request pattern is admin, right? Now, when I drew this diagram, I totally, I totally screwed up. I, it really should be reversed to, to show the order, right? So just imagine that. But that's the way it works. So um, the security filter chain has, has two operations on it. It's, you know, matches, right? The request matcher um, operation. And then it's got get me all the filters, right? So if the current request matches, um, you know, this, the current security filter chain it's iterating over, okay, get me all the filters then, and then apply it, right? In that, apply, the, apply all the filters within that filter chain in that order, right? So that's kind of like the top level view um, of how the Spring Security Filter Chain looks like. I got one minute left, so, and it's game over according to that sign. Thank you very much. Is there any, any other questions? Uh, I'd like to, anybody would like to ask? Catch you next. Back there. Yeah. <clears throat>
it's a it's a little unrelated question so if you're using remember be remember me functionality right yeah. so what part of the the filter chain actually handles that where if you're using hashing based or persistent token based what part actually handles that for us so the remember me authentication processing filter yeah that's the filter that handles the remember me functionality where does that sit in the ordering that's sitting somewhere in the authentication processing filter order um, okay. but that's typically um, sitting behind because that's not full authentication right remember me is not full like I don't want to say partial authentication but it's not fully authenticated you, you're only fully authenticated when you provide credentials right um, so that one's actually sitting after the the, the core authentication processing filters but it's the remember me authentication filter. I'm not sure if I answered your question though, or did I? Yeah, sort of, yeah. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> so uh, the question is, oh, actually, you know, we'll wait for the mic. I just got one more question up here. Yeah, sorry about that. <coughs> over here, yeah, over here. Uh, a, a bit similar to the to the other question uh, about uh, reactive and changing a thread and not being able to use the thread local. When you call another service, typically in a microservice way, how do you pass the context? What's the best way? Treat token, whatever. Is it that is a great question, and once again, Rob is the guy. <laughs> but yeah, we had to make like obviously, you know, Rob and I had discussions about it didn't get too deep into it, but yeah, there's a lot of changes, right? I mean, the whole reactive side of things changes a lot, right? Um, how Rob ultimately implemented that, obviously thread local is not involved, right? Um, how he implemented, I don't know the details, but uh, you could easily, I could easily uh, get that, that question answered for you. Just, we could exchange or you could send it, you could even log an issue on, on Spring Security and, and, and uh, you know, um, ping Rob on it. He'll be happy to answer your question. Okay, no worries. Is there any other questions? Okay, well, thanks a lot and enjoy the day in the conference.